in Deuteronomy, and we're going to finish up chapter 6 and get into chapter 7 today. Now, last week, we took another look at the so-called Shema, the Hear, O Israel. That is both the spiritual and the national credo of the Hebrew people, and it is most certainly the central tenet of Christianity as well. It's just that it has been presented over the centuries as a New Testament doctrine that had never before existed. Now, we finished up by looking at the middle part of Deuteronomy 6, in which a warning was issued for two main temptations that Israel would entertain. First, moving into their promised land with all of its wonderful abundance, and for that day, it's easy living, and then forgetting the God who did it all for them. The warning is that Israel should remember they didn't build those cities and villages where they're going to live. They didn't plant the, vi the vineyards and the orchards for which they would eat. Rather, the Lord took it from the Canaanites and gave it to Israel as their inheritance. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Although the word inheritance is usually only used in our society as something we receive usually when our parents die, in fact it carries with it an important underlying meaning. And that meaning is to receive something of value that somebody else worked to achieve. It's a thing that we have in no way earned. It is achieved only by birthright or by the grace of someone else who wants us to have it. The second warning we receive is that the redeemed people of Israel, who now have inherited by means of God's grace, abundance, and the privilege of a special relationship with the God of the universe, they should not adopt and consort with the gods of the people among whom they're going to live. And if the Hebrews do not heed this warning, destruction is going to be the consequence. Now, I spent some time last week connecting the real meaning of idolatry, which is the chasing after other gods, with what the actual God principle is behind this warning. And that principle is that idolatry speaks of the pursuit of anything that holds a place in one's life that is equal to or greater than God, Jehovah. There has been so much allegorical teaching within our Christian faith that it is easy to chalk this principle off to allegory as well. But this is clearly not the case. The Lord speaks of the seeking after wealth and power and land and other things as being idolatrous if its place is held too high for us. If we ponder it for a moment, we'll see that in a certain way, the worshiping of other gods is kind of a biblical oxymoron. I mean, the worshiping of other gods is itself only an act of intent and of the evil inner self because in reality there are no other gods. So we can send up worship of all these things all day long, but in effect, we're worshiping nothing. The problem is not that God is concerned that some other rival spiritual be being is getting the glory he ought to get. It's that our carnal and our evil minds and hearts choose to disregard him. To make something else, anything else, the ultimate or even the shared goal of our lives. Today, when we hear the word idolatry, we tend to focus on, on little wooden idols or clay objects uh, that people of old made in their prayers. And that kind of misses the point. Anything that holds a place as high as or above the Lord God, Jehovah calls it idolatry. And I really don't think he's interested in our very logical counter-arguments. Our wife, our children, our wealth, our health, our retirement, 
our jobs, our safety, our security, our hobbies, all have the potential to become as gods. And these gods are indeed the gods of other people. Moses says that as redeemed people, Israel is not to adopt those gods. Therefore, non-redeemed people. Well, so it is with us, the chasing after. Money, sex, pleasure, safety, security, at any cost, any of that. That's not for believers. It's not that some proper level of these things are prohibited. It's that we must constantly examine ourselves to see if we deny the Lord his due place in our lives because these other things get in the way. Let's move on now, and we're going to reread a section of Deuteronomy. We're going to start at chapter 6, and verse 16. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 205. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 16. Do not put Adonai, your God, to the test, as you tested him at Massah. Observe diligently the mitzvot, the commandments of Adonai, your God, and his instructions and laws which he's given you. You are to do what is right and good in the sight of Adonai, so that things will go well with you, and you will enter and possess the good land that Adonai swore to your ancestors, expelling all of your enemies ahead of you, as Adonai said. Now, someday, your child will ask you, what is the meaning of the instructions and laws and rulings which Adonai, our God, has laid down for you? Then you'll tell your child, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Adonai worked great and terrible signs and wonders against Egypt. Pharaoh, all of his household before our very eyes. He brought us out from there in order to give us, uh, give to us the land he had sworn to our ancestors that he'd give us. And Adonai ordered us to observe all of these laws, to fear Adonai our God, always for our own good, so that he might keep us alive as we are today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to obey all of these commandments before Adonai, our God, just as he ordered us to do. Starting in Deuteronomy 6.16, Moses tells Israel what they should not do. And after Moses has explained that the Lord will meet all of Israel's needs, so there's no purpose for them, Go around worshiping other people's god idols, nor should they chase after the idolatrous gods or goals of the Canaanites, such as wealth and power and pleasure. Moses now explains to Israel what they should do. And what Israel should do is to obey God and don't test him. And by means of demonstration and example, Moses points to an incident that happened very early on in the Exodus, the incident at Massah. Now, really, the vast majority of the people he's talking to did not have this experience at Massah because they were neither either not born or they were very, very young children. Yet it must be that this infamous happening had become part of the standard tales that parents told their children because Moses makes no attempt to reiterate the circumstances. The mere mention of the name Massah was enough for his audience to fully understand his point. But for your sake, let me jog your memories. Massah was the name given to a place where the Israelites lacked water to drink, so they grumbled to Moses about it. Massah, with an M, means to tempt. And the idea is that the people doubted God's ability to provide for them. And this verse in Deuteronomy says, integrating some Hebrew, do not nasa, in nasa, God, as you did him at the place of tempting. Nasa, and it with an N, means to put him on trial. As a person accused of a crime, we'd be put on trial. It does not mean to try God's patience, as it might seem to our minds. So after Moses admonishes the people to not ever be so audacious as to actually put God on trial, 
as the first generation of the Exodus did, with themselves as his judge. Rather, this new generation should do what's called out in verse 17. They should obey God. The idea is that Israel should not determine for themselves what's right and what's wrong. Or whether God's laws and commandments are optional or fair or even just. Their job is not to question but to learn the laws and then to follow the laws. And this thought is fleshed out a little bit more when it says to always do what is right in the sight of the Lord. This is as opposed to doing what is right in their own sight. And as we followers of Christ move along in both the Old Testament and New, we're going to be exhorted on several occasions to do what is right in the sight of God. Here in Deuteronomy 6, we get the definition of what is right in the sight of God. It is obey God's laws and commandments. It has nothing to do with our being nice or being tolerant or pious looking or happy according to our thoughts and philosophies. And there is a divine reward for obedience. It is that Israel possesses the land and that God will drive out Israel's enemies and then things will go very well for Israel. Resuming now the thought that he stated in verse 7 that is critically important that the law be taught to each succeeding generation, Moses says that the Hebrew children will eventually be curious about Israel's unique way of life. And they're going to ask their parents, why should they follow such laws and commandments? And typically a child asks why something is done if they have something else to compare it to, if there seems to be another viable way. Why do we gather in fellowship to worship God when all these other kids don't? Why do I have to eat my vegetables when I'd just rather have that larger piece of cake that's waiting until the end of the meal? Why do we study Torah and Old Testament along with the New Testament when all my friends just read the gospel stories of Jesus? Why do we do that? See, it's the obvious differences that make for the curiosity. So, says Moses, when your curious children notice these differences between what they're required to do versus what the, the, the pagans are required to do, the Hebrew parents are to say the following thing to them. And it begins with, the, with them saying, we were slaves in Egypt and our God freed us from them. In other words, it's our history that makes us so unique. And as a result of this unique history that's based on a relationship with God, this is why we follow the ways of the one who separated us away from all other peoples on earth. He did it for himself. And Moses says that parents are to say that after God has established them as a separate and unique people, and after God has redeemed them, and after God has rescued them from slavery to an evil taskmaster, after he has sent them to a land all their own, then the Lord commanded them to observe his appointed times and his festivals and to revere him, and thus this pleases him. Therefore, says this great leader of Israel, Moses, it will be to our credit if we do what the Lord, who has done all these things for us, has ordained that we do. All of it. I want to point out here that Moses saying to our credit, in other Bibles it might say to, to our merit, means that obedience brings about goodness and well-being. And that's translated shalom in the Bible. It brings about shalom be towards, towards us as a gift from God. The things that he would like to give us, he is now able to give us because we're being obedient to him. It's the opposite when we disobey, when we trespass against him. And so we incur guilt before God. In that case, his justice does not enable us, enable him to give us the shalom, the general well-being 
that he so greatly desires to give us. Instead, his unmatched holiness has no choice but to deny us at least some of, some of the things he'd like to give us and to discipline us. Let's move on to Deuteronomy chapter 7. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 7. Adonai, your God, is going to bring you into the land you will enter in order to take possession of it. And he will expel many nations ahead of you, the, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations bigger and stronger than you. And when he does this, when Adonai, your God, hands them over ahead of you and you defeat them, you are to destroy them completely. Don't make any covenant with them. Show them no mercy, don't intermarry with them, don't give your daughter to his son, don't take his daughter for your son. He will turn your children away from following me in order to serve other gods. If this happens, the anger of Adonai will flare up against you and he will quickly destroy you. No, treat them this way. Break down their altars. Smash their standing stones to pieces. Cut down their sacred poles. Burn up their carved images completely. For you are a people set apart as holy for Adonai your God. Adonai your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his own unique treasure. Adonai didn't set his heart on you or choose you because you numbered more than other people. On the contrary, you were the fewest of all the peoples. Rather, it was because Adonai loved you. Because he wanted to keep the oath which he had sworn to your ancestors. That and I brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from a life of slavery under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. From this, you can know that Adonai, your God, is indeed God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant. He extends his grace to those who love him, who observe his commandments to a thousand generations. But he repays those who hate him to their face and he destroys them. He will not be slow to deal with someone who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you are to keep the mitzvot, the commands, the laws and the rulings which I am giving you today, and you are to obey them. Because you are listening to these rulings, keeping and obeying them, Adonai your God will keep with you the covenant and mercy that he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, increase your numbers. He will also bless the fruit of your body, the fruit of your ground, your grain, wine, olive oil, the young of your cattle and sheep. In the land, he swore to your ancestors that he'd give to you. You will be blessed more than all other people. There will not be a sterile male or female among you, and the same with your livestock. Adonai will remove all illness from you. He will not afflict you with any of Egypt's dreadful diseases which you've known. Instead, he will lay them on those who hate you. You are to devour all the peoples that Adonai, your God, hands over to you. Show them no pity. Do not serve their gods, because they'll become a trap for you. If you think to yourselves, oh, these nations outnumber us, how can we dispossess them? Nevertheless, you are not to be afraid of them. You are to remember well what Adonai, your God, did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. The great ordeals which you yourself saw, the signs, the wonders, the strong hand and outstretched arm by which Adonai your God brought you out. Adonai will do the same to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, Adonai your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left and those who hide themselves perish ahead of you. You're not to be frightened of them because Adonai your God is there with you, a, great, a, a God great and fearsome. Adonai your God will expel those nations ahead of you little by little. You can't put an end to them all at once, or the wild animals will become too numerous for you. Nevertheless, Adonai, your God, will give them over to you, sending one disaster after another upon them until they have been destroyed. He will hand their kings over to you. You will wipe out their name from under heaven. None of them will be able to stand against you until you've destroyed them. You are to burn up completely the carved statues of their gods. Don't be greedy for the silver or gold on them. Don't take it with you, or you'll be trapped by it. For it's aberrant to Adonai, your God. Don't bring something aberrant into your house, or you will share in the curse that is on it. 
Instead, you are to detest it completely, loathe it utterly, for it is set apart for destruction. There's an important principle that we must constantly refer back to when understanding the instructions that Jehovah God has given and will give concerning how Israel is to conduct the coming holy war upon Canaan. And it is that Israel is to proceed knowing that God is the God of all history. Not just Israelite history. God is the God of all humanity. Not just Hebrew humanity. That everyone other than Israel, by definition, worships false gods. The gods of their Gentile culture that are non-existent gods. And therefore, they do not honor the true creator God. Two key lessons have to be noted here. First, God is indeed the God of everything. But that does not mean that every God honored by whatever name or characteristic he is known is on some level actually honoring Jehovah God. And two, because Jehovah is the God of everything and everyone, he has the right he has the authority to make decisions and choices, the ones he's making. Jehovah has the right to dispossess the Canaanites from their land. He has the right to transfer that land to whomever he chooses because it's his land. So let's talk for just a moment about that point. It's become increasingly popular in our day, even among some evangelicals. To say that it doesn't matter whether a person worships the name of Allah or Krishna or whomever because what these people don't know is that they're all just actually worshiping Jesus. I've heard that so many times. I don't know if it's from an insatiable desire for tolerance or peace at any cost. I, I don't know if it's scriptural ignorance that this notion has been born, but that doctrine so far from truth that it's hard to overlook it or overstate it. If we accept that view, then we have to wonder whether there even is such a thing as idolatry. And if it is, can it even exist in our present age? Were the Canaanites, Canaanites then actually worshipping the pre-incarnate Jesus when they were sacrificing their children to Baal and Kamosh? Were the Amorites merely worshipping Jehovah, God of Israel, when they performed ritual prostitution before the fertility goddess Ashtoreth? It's only they just didn't use the right name. I, mean, I hope you see the problem here. Part of the issue is even the misconception of the Hebrew word Shem, which in translated to English means name. The word Shem means far more than simply the formal, familial identity that's given to someone. It more means reputation, nature, that person's characteristics. To the Hebrews, names held great meaning because embodied within a name was a set of attributes that the person with that name would be known by and would be expected to uphold. So understand that when the Lord is ordering Israel not to worship other gods, it's not only a matter of the Hebrews using an incorrect name to worship him. It's that the characteristics assigned to all those false gods are the polar opposites from the characteristics that define Jehovah God. This also means that we modern day believers have to be very careful when we willy-nilly define who God is and assign him characteristics he doesn't have, or we take away those divine characteristics that we would prefer he didn't have, to make God a God who winks at sin, but he doesn't take action any longer. Or a God who accepts homosexuality and bestiality because he loves everyone and he places love above his laws and commandments and his own holiness. Or he is a God who disciplines everybody but Christians, 
See, all this is a dangerous error. To do any of this is to essentially define a God who doesn't exist. And then to attach the name Yehovah to that God, who is created from our own minds and our fanciful doctrines and our modern political stances, okay, that's the purest definition of the meaning of idolatry. You know, many years ago, I once knew a man who was a churchgoer for decades. He was in an adult Sunday school class that I taught way long ago. And he came up to me after one particular lesson and said that he was very offended and he was never going to return. And the issue was that on that day, I had spoken about the Lord's justice and about the Lord's judgment. And he told me that his God, Jesus, was a God of pure love and nothing else, so we have to be talking about two different gods. And true to his word, he never came back to the class. Now, folks, as much as we all love love, and as much as we all recognize that perhaps the outstanding characteristic of our God is love, that hardly defines all of his characteristics. Among other things, God is a God of light. He's a God of creation. He's a God of salvation. He's a God of mercy. He's also a God of judgment and wrath and fury and gentleness. He is a God who is near death. He's also not of our world, our universe, or probably even our dimension. He is not a man. And he's not a superhuman. Rather, he's an entirely different being. Totally unique. He will spark new life. He will preserve life. And yet he will destroy life according to his sovereign will and purposes. And what I'm listing here is embarrassingly inadequate to, to define even a fraction of who God is. But the Lord has also given us enough of his characteristics by means of his written word and has shown us how these characteristics are in a perfect proportion and balance that for us to ever assign his name to another God whose characteristics are grossly different, different and infinitely inferior, well, that's an abomination of the highest order. Therefore, verse 1 says, that Jehovah your God is going to bring you, Israel, into Canaan and expel the current inhabitants in order that you, Israel, will possess it. And then seven nations are named that are going to be removed from that land and replaced by Israel. Now, although we talked about this concept of possessing the land quite some time ago, I want to briefly remind you that to possess it does not mean to own it. When it comes to the land of Canaan, the term possess is used because the land had always been set apart for special use by the Lord, and it will always be. Over and over again, the Torah and the whole remainder of the Bible informs us that Jehovah God is the sole and permanent owner of the land of Canaan. Mankind is certainly allowed to own and to buy and to sell chunks of real estate there. There's no biblical injunction against it. Here in America, or in Europe, and throughout most of the world, the concept of a man owning a piece of property is not only legal and foundational in almost all of our earthly societies, but there's no scriptural prohibition against that. However, this does not apply to one well-defined piece of land in the Middle East that the Bible calls Canaan, and then essentially is called, eventually rather, is called Israel. Because that piece of land, the Lord's only willing to lease it out. I'm not going to sell. The Lord retains all rights to revoke the lease on that land at any time. So Israel has no right to sell land to one another, let alone to a foreigner. This land is special, it's holy, it's set apart, it's reserved for God as the headquarters of his earthly kingdom and the coming 
kingdom of God. We find this concept of possession versus ownership at the forefront of the laws of the Jubilee. Whereby land that has been sold, so to speak, has to be returned to the original owner. This law only applies to the Holy Land. Nowhere else. Or in more correct terms, the use of the land that has been transferred to somebody else is eventually terminated. And the use of that land then is ultimately restored to the person who was originally assigned to. In the law, the law of Moses, the price that a person could charge for land was based only on what the land could produce between the time he leases it and the occasion of the next jubilee. Because it's only the use of the land that can be temporarily transferred. Now, I hope you see the significant difference between owning and possessing. And why, why is, when Israel was exiled from the land, the Lord was but revoking Israel's use of the land as a means of discipline. And was only transferring the use of the land to Israel's conquerors for a set time because these conquerors were God's proxy for his punishment of his people. And it is also why this abomination called the, the Roadmap to Peace or the Oslo Accords or whatever the name of the current negotiations is, the so-called peace plan for the governments of men to force the transfer of ownership of portions of God's land or even to transfer possession of portions of that land from Israel to somebody else, this is disobedience. It's arrogance at the highest level. It's just daring God to react. For a sizable segment of the church to back those plans, even for many Jews to assert that this is a very good thing, well, that's just a painful thing for me to witness. So what we have in Deuteronomy chapter 7 is Moses addressing a series of very specific issues that the Israelites are going to face when they invade Canaan. And in addition to the issue of land possession, is what to do about the people who currently live there. How are they going to be dealt with? And the Israelites are told in a nutshell that they are to grant the Canaanites no terms and give them no quarter. They are not to intermarry. This means no Hebrew sons marrying Canaanite women, no Hebrew daughters being given in marriage to Canaanite men. Whatever Canaanites might remain in the land are to have their altars of sacrifice to their false gods torn down and smashed. And kind of any kind of religious pillar or monument to one god or another is to be smashed. Their idols, their images of the gods that are discovered are to be thrown into a fire and burned up. Now what exactly does all this amount to? Is this about, is this suggesting merciless genocide? Now first, Giving the Canaanites no terms and no quarter means no agreements or treaties are to be made between Israel and the Canaanites that would allow them to remain there as their own sovereign societies. It means that Israel is not to essentially do what's always done in these kinds of situations since time immemorial. And that is to allow a foreign king to remain king over his own people in return for that king paying taxes and tribute and contributing uh, tribute and contributing labor to the conqueror. In this case, it would be Israel. And further, those Canaanites who refuse to bow down to the God of Israel are not to be allowed to remain in the land, rather than to be forcibly expelled. And if they insist on fighting to the death to stay, they're to be accommodated. Now, despite the thought that many rabbis would like to leave, with, leave us with, and the overly simplistic tales that we've all been told about how the Hebrews did not intermarry, and for long stretches of time stayed very pure in their gene pool, nothing could be further from either biblical truth or historical reality. Hebrew men just could not seem to resist the charms of these various beautiful pagan women and constantly brought them home with them and integrated them into Hebrew society. In the book of Judges, we see even the great Samson, Mary who? A Philistine woman. This, though, was just the tip of the iceberg. 
because in the Middle Eastern cultures, Israel included, a girl didn't have much choice in whom she married. Her father made that determination. Usually, it was based on how big of a, of a gift a man, a man might offer the father in return for his daughter's hand in marriage. That a father would offer his daughter to the highest bidder? I'm sure bothers some of you. I mean, that's, that's kind of bad, seems like. That an Israelite father would allow a non-Hebrew to be one of the bidders. Well, that was forbidden. But it happened all the time. The problem with a Hebrew man marrying a foreign woman was that except in rare cases, she would bring with her the pagan ways of her tribe. And along with it, the family pressure and the influence from her kin for her Hebrew husband to at least be tolerant and respectful of her and their beliefs. We will eventually see the revered King Solomon marry literally hundreds of foreign wives, be openly tolerant, of their worship of pagan gods, and even arrange for altars to be built for them so that they could sacrifice to their own false gods. For a Hebrew woman to be married off to a foreign man was a terrible predicament for that woman. Because once she was wed to that foreigner, she lost her status as an Israelite. Further, the children she bore would now be considered Gentiles apart from Israel. The redemption that she had as a birthright was gone. The redemption that her children could have had as a birthright was gone. So the effect of disobeying the command not to intermarry with any one of these seven named people groups was far-reaching. Now, as for these seven nations of I'm not going to try to carefully define them all. It would just be too complex for our purposes. Most of them were just tribes descended from Canaan, a grandson of Noah. So they could all rightly be lumped together and given the general identity as Canaanites, and they often are. In the same way that a man from the tribe of Judah or Reuben or Benjamin could rightfully be called an Israelite because he was descended from Jacob, called Israel. However, that was not the case for every nation of that seven that were specifically mentioned. Some of these names are less about tribes, more about simply describing what region they inhabited. Which is which isn't important for us for the moment. What is important are the reasons for the drastic action being called for by God, the prohibition against peace treaties against any form of tolerance, against intermarriage. And it is that the Israelite children, meaning descendants, of future generations would be drawn away from God and into idolatry. I want you to note, this statement is a statement of fact. It's not an idle threat. It's not a hypothetical warning. That is, the Lord is saying, if you do any of these things, I'm telling you, don't do, it's 100% certain that the result will be a falling away from the true religion and an adoption or a blending in of paganism. I want you to hear this. Any of us who've lived long enough have at one time or another succumbed to this reality. There is absolutely no way that we can marry a non-believer or buy into the ways of the non-believing world, worship their gods, so to speak, or even get close enough to the ways of the world to gain the benefits while trying not to get sucked in without having some tough consequences as a result. I've heard so many say, so many believers say, when they do decide to venture down this dangerous path, eh, I know it's dangerous, but I'm strong in the Lord, so I'll be all right. Really. Good luck. The problem is that what we're saying when we either think that way or we make that kind of statement is that we can do 
the very things the Lord says don't do, but that somehow He'll honor it. And then make sure that none of the bad stuff happens to us. I mean, do we often go long periods of time when it seems that we've kind of gotten away with it? We kind of breathe a sigh of relief, only to suddenly have that other shoe fall. And then we recognize the unchanging nature of God and the immutability of his laws and commandments. See, this is what God is telling Israel. This is what he's telling all who intend to rely on him. And in the end, the fundamental prerequisite for Israel's survival in Canaan was the exclusive worship of Yehovah, God of Israel. Disobedience and idolatry would automatically be, bring divine calamity. The nature of that calamity would range from constant harassment from foreigners to famines to having wicked Israelite kings who would be oppressive to their own people. And on a couple of occasions, outright eviction from the land. Exile. So Moses explains a couple of facts of life. Hey, don't get too big for your britches when you do gain possession of the land. Because it isn't your might or your military acumen or overwhelmingly large numbers of soldiers that's going to win the day. It's only because the Lord has decided to favor you, Israel. He has essentially discriminated against the indigenous people of Canaan. It's only this reality that Israel is able to receive victory in this monumental task, this impossible task. And second, this is really all about the fulfillment of an oath, a covenant, that God made to the patriarchs that Israel is receiving Canaan as their soul possession. But Moses warns, huh, all of this can be reversed, at least for a time, if you fail to observe the Lord's commandments. So starting in verse 12, more reasons now are given for Israel to be obedient. Sometimes these passages remind me talks I've had with my own children, particularly when they were growing up. Most parents will reminisce and speak of talking to their kids until they're blue in the face trying to get some very important messages across of looking into those blank, disinterested faces with their faraway stares, saying the same thing in as many ways as we can think of in hope that the nuances of this message will somehow hit home and that our beloved offspring will heed some advice and avoid serious trouble. Somehow I picture Moses looking into the thousands of these blank faces, knowing, oh boy, as soon as I'm done, you guys are just going to run for the hills. Rebellion shall begin. But it won't be for not trying. And the Lord lays out the mercy and the abundance is just waiting for Israel under the conditions that he's established. The women will be fertile. Israel's population will blossom. The soil will produce. The animals will thrive. Serious disease and pestilence won't even be allowed to injure the Hebrews. But it will strike down their enemies that live right next door. The Lord will cause Israel to be greatly victorious in battle. But this is only so long as the Israelite warriors show their foes no pity. Ooh. That really goes against the Christian grain, doesn't it? Well, just refer back to the God principle I laid out at the beginning of this lesson. The Lord is the Lord of everyone and everything. The Canaanites are his creations just as much as Israel and what he decides is their fate is up to him. It's just that we've been well-schooled to think of the, of the concept of, of, of loss and calamity more in terms of a shrinking bank account or, or a home being repossessed or our job is eliminated or, or, or maybe even a loved one dies from a terrible accident or a horrifying disease. 
But here the Lord is talking about wiping out entire nations on a wholesale basis to accomplish his will of giving the land of Canaan as he has promised to Israel. This reality is what has led to this implied, if not outright stated doctrine, that the God of the Old Testament is of a quite different nature than the God of the New Testament. And I remind you, though, that the God of the Old Testament is going to continue this holy war upon people who are not his elect on a scale unimaginable to our human minds. The battle of Armageddon is coming. It is going to be the bloodiest, most devastating ending to this holy war that began with Joshua at the helm and hundreds of millions are going to adopt, are going to die and there's going to be no apologies. And who is going to lead that battle? Who are we told is going to lead that battle? Jesus. Christ. Yeshua. Our Messiah. The God of the New Testament. It is going to make what went on in Canaan 3,000 years ago look like child's play. Starting in verse 17, Moses addresses what he knows the people are thinking. How does he know it? Because he saw the same thing 38 years earlier. Is it that the people really like the idea of having this wonderful land all their own? But they don't much like the part about having to fight and many of them losing their lives in battle in order to get it. 38 years ago, the people were so afraid of war that they betrayed God and the consequences are well known. So Moses is trying to ward off these very natural fears that this younger generation might have in conquering Canaan. Therefore, he tells Israel, bear in mind what God did to Egypt and he's going to do the essentially the same thing to the Canaanites for you. Then Moses tells them, not to be concerned or upset when it takes a little longer than they hope for to conquer Canaan. Because if too many Can Canaanites are, are killed too quickly or the land is purged of them too fast, Israel won't even have the necessary time to establish security. So wild animals are going to move in. I mean, does this sound a little like what we kind of encountered in the... This Iraq war that seems been going on forever. I mean, what the Lord is doing in the instructions for attacking Canaan is actually very practical, even though it does kind of go against human tendencies. See, in Iraq, all now agree that although we invaded and we won rapidly in what seemed like a miraculous fashion, it was actually too fast. We got big-headed about it. We didn't take the time needed to conquer smaller zones, establish secure areas, move on, take another one, do the same, then another. We tried to swallow an elephant in one bite. Boy, it's come at great cost. The wild animals, Al-Qaeda, other terrorist organizations, guess what? They've moved in. At the same time, just as God and Moses know that the people are going to be short-sighted and impatient, so Moses is preparing the people for what will happen. This is the identical reason that our government decided it would not go slow in taking Iraq because the Americans want fast results. The best and most fruitful way of attacking Iraq would never have been accepted by an American or a world public that wants a video game conflict over in an hour and nobody actually gets hurt. Believe me, I'm not making any kind of political speech. I'm trying to use as an illustration that most will easily recognize that this is very parallel with what Moses is facing. However, says the Lord, don't let this slower speed seem to you as though maybe things aren't going well. That's not what's happening here. Rather, I'll deliver the Canaanite kings up to you and throw the Canaanite armies into a complete panic so that they'll often just run away. The victory will be so complete 
as it says in verse 24, that not even the names of the kings and military leaders will be remembered. Then Moses returns to the two aspects of idolatry that we've talked about on a few occasions. Don't take their idols, because you're liable to worship them, and don't even take the gold and silver they're made out of. Because the desire for all that gold and silver is just as idolatrous as the idols themselves. And as the Lord says in verse 26, he utterly detests anything that Israel or we might bring into his presence that rivals him. Therefore, whatever that thing that could be a rival to him is, it must be destroyed. Not because God is a miser or a curmudgeon and doesn't want us to have nice things or a comfortable life. It's because of the danger to our relationship and our harmony with him. That's what he's concerned about. Next time we'll start Deuteronomy chapter 8. Please rise.